All right, just getting home from Nashville after a few nights away. It's midnight on Sunday, but I wanted to make sure I get this done for the podcast for tomorrow. Have a special episode of the podcast. We have a big mayor's race coming up in November. We have two great candidates, and I have them both on the podcast this week. We're going to start the podcast off with my interview with Susan DeChambeau. Ask her a bunch of questions about her background, things she loves about Bitterford. You'll see all the questions. And then 25 minutes in, we're going to switch to my interview with Marty. Um, ask them the same exact questions. You can really see their passion for Bitterford, how they might differ on a few things. But I think if you're a voting citizen of Bitterford and you're not sure who you're going to vote for, I think this podcast will help you learn a little bit about the candidates, a little bit about their background and what their visions for Bitterford are. So um, if you're new to the podcast, your first time listening because you saw it on Facebook or someone shared it with you, do me a favor and subscribe on Spotify, YouTube, or Apple. I would really appreciate the support. So thanks again for checking it out. Here's Sue. All right. I'm joined by Susan DeChambeau. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast, Sue. Oh, thank you for inviting me. We have a big mayoral race about a month out, and I thought it would be a fun idea to have you come on and talk about Bitterford, talk about your campaign and all that stuff. So I'm glad that you're up for it. <laughs> well, I have to be. I better. <laughs> <laughs> Is this your first podcast? Yes. And I'm not going to say blog or anything <laughs> like that. No. You know, it's funny because I had Coach Carrot on the podcast, one of my first handful of podcasts, and he referred to it as a blog, which always made me laugh. And I still poke fun at him about this, but. Um, Less than old people. That's <laughs> <laughs> it is all good. I'm glad. I'm glad that you're on. Look forward to talking to you. We're going to just kind of jump right into things. I wanted you to share your personal background along with like your political background. So people get a sense for that leading up to the election. Do you mind sharing that with me? My personal, so my upbringing and yeah, where... I mean, just, just your background yeah. leading up to when it transitioned more into politics. So yeah. So... Okay. Oh, go, go soft. Right. <laughs> All right. Well, I am born and raised in Biddeford. I can't say born. I was born in Portland and raised by proud to say three generations in the same house, always Meme and Pepe downstairs and my parents upstairs and five kids in total. Mm -hmm. I will tell you that my mother's first husband was killed in World War II. Okay. She was 29 years old and had two children at the time, something like five and seven. Mm -hmm. And a few years later, she married my dad. So my half siblings are 10 years older than I. So there's, it's almost like two generations. I am the oldest of the DeChambos. I have a brother, Richard, who lives in Georgia and a brother, Paul, who lives in Hollis. We're all very close. And so the thing that has formulated me in my life is my grandparents' business that was a business for 101 years and was managed by four generations of Lara Shells. Yep. And that's the White Star Laundry. That's right. And the reason for that is there was only a driveway separating our home and the laundry. Mm -hmm. And I grew up six years old folding towels. And when I was a teenager, I would clean, not clean, but take care of the St. Louis football uniforms. <laughs> They would play on Friday night. It would get muddy. They would wash them, and they were made with wool, so you huh. can't put them in the dryer. Isn't that so funny? That's so funny. God. So, you know, I want to tell you, Randy, you know my son. When they the laundry closed in 2013, yep. my son wrote a letter to the editor saying that he had lost a friend. I did not know his feeling about the laundry was the same as mine. They were an extended family to us and yep. they helped us grow. I'll go real quick. My, yep. I am a single mom. I have an adult son and my personal life is I had the career I knew I wanted when I was 12 years old. And that was a social worker at a training school for juveniles. Yep. And from there, I worked with adult offenders for 43 years, and I've held a number of positions. No and kidding. personally, uh, as you know, politically, you know, that that's a whole different avenue. But that's, very a, that's a long career. And then, yeah. you know, then 
it's interesting to think that you had that full career and then after that kind of transition into politics. I mean, I'm sure some of it overlapped, but why don't you tell me more about that? Well, politics for me started when I was a state employee. 1972, I started. Mm -hmm. There was no union for state employees. We were an association. And when it came to raises, we never knew about raises. I was instrumental in collective bargaining in 1978. And I was on the first negotiating contract for the state of Maine. So I've got negotiating skills that I learned there. So that's a little political. Yeah. Yeah. And that contract took 17 months to negotiate. Brutal. Yeah, well, it was the first one. They didn't yeah. want to do it and it was state employees. So yeah, you have to go with the punches. After that, when my son was born, my mother says, that's your job for the next 18 years. You're not going to meetings anymore. <laughs> yep. So as soon as Dominic was in the first grade, I said, I'm going to be a police commissioner. <laughs> so, so I started with police commission and then I got involved with the education department and I was on a committee and with the editor of the Journal Tribune at the time, Bob Melville. Yeah. I, I've met up with great people. I learned so much from him. Two years of rewriting every policy in the school department. And that's going to help me as being mayor because the mayor is the chair of the school department also. Yep. So, and I guess politically, not politically, but I've been a board member of the People's Choice Credit Union for 20 years. Yep. So, and then of course, I was a city councilor and and the state so yeah. so that that's pretty much all politics and in the middle of that is being on some committees also how long were you a state rep for quick Pardon? how long were you a state rep for well i'll correct you i was a state senator, state senator. <laughs> i Fulfilled, a, a filled a vacancy. So I was a midterm senator that was, yep. high, you know, and if you recall, the, the governor at the time did not, he refused to swear me in. He was upset and it took five days to swear me in. I want to thank him. It made me more popular than I thought I could become. <laughs> what was the um, reasoning for that again? Pun? What was the reasoning for that again? Well, this is inside politics, but yeah. it was made public the day before one of his nominees to the Unemployment Compensation Board was before the Labor Board, I believe, or the Labor Committee of the legislature. And of course, the Democrats were the majority at the time, hmm. but there was a vote and he was not voted in because of some comments he made, I believe. Mm -hmm. The next morning, I was told to be there at 10 o'clock. He would swear me in. My family was there. And the governor came in, had his coffee. They told him that his nominee was not appointed. So he said that he was not going to swear me in that day. So, so it was not obviously nothing personal, nothing about you. It was just not, no, politics. He didn't even know me, but he, yeah. you know, he missed out on meeting my family anyway. Uh, so. Yeah. That's unfortunate. So you had a good run there. You wrapped up. I did up that. four terms. Yeah, four yeah. terms. Four terms. Yeah, yeah it's, that's quite a quite a length. What made you decide to run for mayor then after that? Well, four terms is your term limited. So I ended December of twenty two. Mm -hmm. I then look for something to do, and I'm on the board of the Biddeford Cultural and Heritage center a com center yeah. i from there i learned i am learning how to archive and i've got all the archives from saint jean Vadsis, yeah. and i'm going through that and as far as running for mayor i was asked first of all and i i feel like i've got the talents the skill the background to do it and it'll, i i just think i'll fit in fine absolutely <laughs> yeah. So how about, how about Bitterford? Let's talk about Bitterford. What are the things that you love about Bitterford? Well, I grew up, we all grew up in a, a different Bitterford. And you, you know, it's nostalgic, I guess. We 
think back how close we all were, Friday nights downtown, football games, everything. Right now, we are reinventing community. It's different. Now you've got like the heart of Biddeford doing events, like it was a fantastic river jam and even more so at Oktoberfest. It was packed. Um, I drove by and it looked like a great event. Oh my bummed. God. I was bummed that I wasn't there, honestly. They were overwhelmed and it'll be better <laughs> next year. I'm sure. And that's where we're getting a sense of community and the the city has a diversity, equality person where... The Knights of Columbus two weeks ago put on Ubuntu, and there were different people from different parts of Africa performing. They live in Biddeford. And so we're alive. We're growing. You know, there are so many. Let me tell you, when I would walk into the Senate chambers the last year or two, before the meeting starts, Towns like Waterville, Brewer, or Lewiston said, what the heck's going on in Biddeford, you know? And awesome. I said, well, it only took 50 years, but <laughs> you, you you chip away at it. You you never give up and it won't be overnight. So um, it's uh, been fun to see, you know, driving by, driving downtown at, you know, Friday, Saturday night, there's so many people walking around. There's so many things to do. It is, it's a lot different from when I was in high school. And at the time when I was in high school and Dom was in high school, we're only a few years apart. It I thought Biddeford was a was a great place, and you know I, I loved my time growing up in Biddeford, but it's changed so much since then. You know, it's been it's been very cool to see. So, well, I think your parents feel like me when we <laughs> raised you guys. We were so afraid you'd go away to college and never come back, and what have you. And Dom's the same way. Mm-hmm. He absolutely loves this city, yeah. and it's it he takes advantage of it. You yeah. know. That's I great. think he has his own seat at, at Mulligan's, you know? Ah, <laughs> uh, Mulligan's. You know, it's it's only a matter of, I believe Mulligan's will not be a thing, you know, in the foreseeable future. Yeah. But, you know, great memories over there. What, what a spot. Yeah. You know. How about the biggest challenges facing Biddeford? What, what are some of the biggest challenges that you see? We're not unique. And I, I'm going to use the word affordability. Mm-hmm. And... That's with a big A because it isn't just affordable housing, which is paramount. And I'll, as far as affordability is, you go to the grocery store and you're not being able to afford the foods you're used to or the cuts of meat or mm-hmm. what have you. And I'm stick a shock every time I go. Yeah. There's affordability, affordability issues there. The interest rate nationwide is going up. You can't even afford a car. And then the housing, it, it is sad. The the apartments that we have in Biddeford, it depends which ones you stay. And let's mm-hmm. not forget the apartments and the landlords who are mom and dad living on Gertrude Street, you know, West Street, mm-hmm. what have you. They've got apartments uh, over their garage and what have you. And those are reasonable and they're part of the family. Downtown apartments, um, you see young people after college get their career, making a good salary. But I don't think they want to continue paying through the window (laughs) $2,400 a month for a one bedroom or 12, you know. So the affordability is not just Biddeford, it's nationwide is how to buy a house. You're not going to find a $300,000 house anymore. And that impacts the taxes. So that's, that's a challenge, but it's not truly unique. Not a- that's something I would reach out more and regionally and state. We've got a lot of good bills and I would commend, of course, Speak Effecto with his bill. I'm on the planning board. Mm-hmm. We are approving so many apartments. And now we're going to be focusing more. When you bill 400 apartments, you better have a place in the back that for the children to play. Yeah. That's you know? a good idea. Yeah. Yeah. So it's you funny can... that you mentioned the planning board because I, I own some apartments in Biddeford. And... <laughs> I'm, try, I'm, I'm trying to get in touch with, I think it's David and Eric and they will not respond to my emails. Nan is the person that 
has been kind of trying to be my go-between, but it's funny that you're on that board. But the reason I reached out to them is because I have some potential to add apartment space to one of my buildings. And I think more and more people are trying to find ways to increase the units that they have. And I think it's very important. You know, the, the cost of, of housing is no joke right now. There's just not enough of it either. So the, the more we can do to in, increase the amount of housing, I think the better. Well, we're, we've got ordinances about backlogs, so mm-hmm. to allow people who have, you know, 25 acres to build an in-law a house or, yep. or someone for the... But ask that or maybe of my opponent, since he's on the city council, the yep. planning board is now just two, is now just two people. Yep. And they don't, they don't necessarily have the skills of every everything uh, yeah. they're having to juggle that and we yeah. just lost the head one. Oh, did we really yeah, that's, uh, that's where it hurt he just retired and the same can be said about the finance department there is no one there so yeah. that, that explains why it's so hard to get well we're a department. service agency and we should mm-hmm. provide a service Mm-hmm. And you shouldn't have to wait for the phone call. You know, Don, well, I'm going to talk to Ann tomorrow and David. <laughs> Maybe Please this will I'm going on. I'm going on just about a month since I first reached out with multiple emails in between and just no response. But that's an aside. You know what I mean? I know I know people are busy, but like I'm a taxpayer, you know, so it's nice to. Nope, it's, I agree. It's nice to hear you hear you say that. What are your thoughts on the parking garage? Is that something that you, you find talking about a lot or you hear some of the chatter that's online or is it just. Yes. Um. I remember the debate and people upset saying it's silly and people also saying, are we building a garage for the developers that just redid the apartments because there's really no parking? Mm -hmm. Probably all of that is true. One of the discussions and arguments was that, and the city manager said it himself, what was expected to happen, like right before the garage and right after, they're gonna be there's gonna be a park there, there's gonna be retail. The plans are still in the infant stage and mm-hmm. they're working on it, but it didn't come to fruition as quickly as they thought. So one thing I kept saying, and that's the first thing that we should find out, we I would hope there isn't an ironclad contract. We have, and it's layers of management. There's this group, and I think they're based out of London. My opponent did ask for a workshop at the city council, and the owner, it was a little difficult to understand him, or he not understand him, to hear him. He's from London. And I thought, my God, here he is on Zoom. They didn't get any good answers. Now, that's the company that owns it. Yeah. They hire a company to manage it, and that's the company we need to talk about. That all, Everything my opponent says is correct. I can say the same thing. Mm-hmm. It is hard to even pay to go. Yeah. But I think we need it because it it was part of the bigger plan. And I know how people feel, but it's we need it. We're yeah. going to need it. No. I think I don't think COVID helped. Probably the timing of COVID with everything that was going on. I mean, I don't know that to be true, but it seems like COVID happened while that was being built and probably set some people back a little bit. A lot of things were being built at the same time, and mm-hmm. you talk about the planning department. Three people. You've mm-hmm. got to be the jack of all trades. You're 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 renovating an old soccer old shop. You're talking now of tearing down where Subway is. Tim Harrington, who owns the Lincoln, owns that land. It's going to go all the way to the Rotary. There's going to be beautiful apartments and retail stores all along the river. So as you enter Bitterfit from Saco Route 1, it will be big time. Really good. I heard those plans. It's amazing. I actually had John the Liberty on the podcast, and he's the CEO of the company that redid the levy. And we were talking a little bit about the plans for, for that part of town. It was, it's, hey, that sounds awesome. You know, I, he, he's going to be great if a bit of it. Yeah. He's got great ideas. Yeah, yeah, no, for sure. I know they're, they're working on more stuff and putting some townhomes and other little condos there. And that whole entrance way to Bitterford sounds like it's going to be amazing. So I look forward to that. Don't want to rush it. Time goes fast <laughs> enough, but, but it, it sounds very cool to hear the plans that people have in the works over there. Yeah. Yeah. I was just, I was telling him when he was on the podcast too. I'm like, I just wish 
that we could get someone to clean up that railroad crossing over the street. You know, just like, I feel like yeah. that's such like a nice entryway into the, into town, especially with the completion of the levee and whatever's going to be on the right side. Like that whole area could be just like this awesome welcome into the town, but it's just like overgrown trees and the rusty old train tracks. But maybe at some point as that comes together. We have reached out many times and for many years and it's the railroad company. Yeah. It's the railroad. And there's a million overpasses that they own throughout many downtown or towns and across the country. So it's hard to get them to care about one particular one that affects us. But no, come with me. I had plans of buying green paint and just painting it. Oh, man. It could look so good. It could look so great. Like a welcome to bitter. It would be awesome. But yeah. you never know. At some point, maybe that'll get taken care of. But I understand the challenges of it. It's yeah. just nice to hear about all the development that's going on over there. I, I personally think it's a good thing. I know that people would say that the city's only focused on those type of big projects and getting this expensive housing in and it doesn't, you know, it's more expensive than mm -hmm. ever for an older person that's on a fixed income to live here. But I don't know, you know, what the solution is for that stuff. You know, I just know that like, I think growing the town and improving the town is kind of like a rising tide that rises all ships, but I do know that it makes things more expensive for everybody else. Well, when you're all done with the school board, get on the planning board. If you are a landlord, you it's amazing. It's, yeah. It, yeah so. I do think of like the next things beyond the school committee. School committee has been great. Really enjoyed the relationships that I've built and learning everything they have. But there's there's other roles that I might be interested in too. So good. that's, that's so good to come, hear. Come see me when I'm there. <laughs> we'll talk more about it. Uh, all right. So so wrapping up, what is, what's your pitch? Why should anyone from Bitterford vote for you for mayor? Oh, well, my experience all through life, I know how to negotiate. I worked for local, county. I've been in county budget committees, the county and the state in, in many different areas. So I think that, that negotiations, the other thing, I didn't talk about my career as a social worker. Mm -hmm. I think what how I approach politics and and issues is so much ingrained in the methodology of being a caseworker. You look at a problem, you think about it, you develop a plan and you execute. Mm -hmm. And that's true of everything I do and uh, any issue. Uh, I've been successful in doing that. I also, I know how to manage money. I failed to mention one feather in my cap about 25 years ago, we built the first woman's prison in almost 80 years. I was given $11 million to do that. I designed it. I put the programs in there and did it for $6 million. Unbelievable. So, what happens with the extra money in those situations? Because that ought, never happens. You, you want to know? <laughs> they made the lobby at the main state prison for men larger. <laughs> In that uh, case, do you wish you spent the money or because here you no, are being responsible with, with it, the money and then it no, just goes. Uh, that, there's politics in, in state also, a lot of it. It was, I contend, we had 70 women at the time <laughs> and I contend I want to build it for a hundred because <laughs> build it, they come, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and I was the only female in the architect and design and, and others said, no, no, the population's going to go down. So they cut my bed capacity from 100 to 70. Yeah. And now we have about 170 women. Uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. What the heck? Uh, unbelievable. 1,600 men. So. That's crazy. So, yeah. That's crazy. So, well, I appreciate you coming on the podcast and sharing those stories. I, I wish you best of luck in the election. Thank you. And, and thanks again. Thank you. All right, thanks for watching the first half of the episode with Susan DeChambeau. Here's Marty Groman. All right, I'm joined by Marty Groman. Thank you for coming back on the podcast. Yeah, it's been great to be back on and the esteemed Randy Forster podcast. You've been doing a lot of great episodes and I enjoy listening. Appreciate the support. So round two, excited about it, but this time it's a little bit different. You're actually running for mayor of Biddeford now. You're in the middle of campaign season. There's a month or so, give or take a little bit until election day. And I wanted to have you on the podcast to talk about 
some of the things that are important to you as you do your campaign and ask voters to vote for you on election day. So are you up for it? Yeah, I'm absolutely 100% in. I'm excited about it. I think it can make a great next mayor of Biddeford, and I'd love to tell you why. <laughs> awesome. Well, I'm glad we're making it happen. In today's day with the lack of a local newspaper and you know other ways that people consume news, I figured a podcast would be a cool way to get that message out and maybe connect with some people that you wouldn't connect with otherwise. So it's worth a shot. Yeah, 100%. 100%. So for the people that may not have heard our last podcast or be unfamiliar with you in general, why don't you give a little bit of background personally and then professionally and then politically as well? Yeah, sure. So I'm the youngest of eight kids. I grew up on a farm in Western Maine in a little town called Carthage. No one else has ever heard of it either. <laughs> and we raised Jersey cows. I grew up milking the cows before the school bus every day and I went through Deergo schools and really wanted to kind of find a way to move myself ahead. So I went off to RPI, got an engineering degree in chemical engineering and had jobs all over the country and actually all over the world, including in Austria, but yeah. found that there was nowhere that I liked as much as Maine. And I think like a lot of Maine kids, I wanted to come back and I had developed a real expertise in a segment of the market called wood composite decking. A lot of people know the Trex name and I yeah. had helped a bunch of those companies get started. And I thought Maine has sawdust. I'm a plastics guy. I can do that. I was 30 years old. I figured this is my chance. And so I kind of looked around for real estate in a good spot and landed on Biddeford at that point. Yep. So you opened your business there, moved your home here, yep. started, a, started a family here. Yep. Yeah, that was and in 1999. Yeah, yep. yeah. I met Bob Dodge and that was before the industrial park was named after him and moved in there and and really had a good run and the town was very good to me, had great support, you know, the, the, the DDC at that time welcomed me and the chamber and everybody and uh, it's a nice chance to, to grow a business. And I yeah, had a good run, but actually in, in 2009, we we're in considerable trouble along with, you know, Lehman Brothers and everybody else, but our bank had just bought nationwide or countrywide mortgage in, yep. in the year before, and they, they came calling for every penny that was due. So. I was able to arrange a white night sale. A lot of people know that business is correct. Deck. Now it's called Zero Life Decking yep. and it's still there uh, 23 yeah, years is. later. I'm proud of that. They're doing well. The joke is it's doing better without me, but I, I'm also proud of that. So just the other day at a mixed sports bar, I ran into one of the shipping guys. Been there, worked for me back then, works for them now. And I think it's yep. great. That's awesome. So you also went on to have a pretty solid political career after that business dealing. Yeah, pretty passionate about uh, trying to give back and, you know, promoting business and entrepreneurship in Maine. So I had an opportunity in 2014 to run for state rep, and I was proud to represent Biddeford in the Maine state legislature for a couple of terms for 2014 to 2018 and learned a lot on that on that journey and made lots of good connections uh, around the state uh, that I think I can build on now. And you're currently a city councilor as well? I represent Ward 3, uh, which I'm very proud of, you know, Ray's Market, Guinea Road, through that area. Yep. And obviously all the wards in the city are great, but it's been, a, it's been a really good experience and we got a good council. We've done some good work, but yep. there's a ton more to do. Totally. So, and now Mayor Casavant's retiring after I think 12 years as mayor. So 12 this years, year. yeah. He's a legendary Biddeford mayor. Not mm -hmm. the longest serving ever. I think Papa Lozier served 14 years, but Alan, I think, will go down in history as I saw a picture of him from 2011 when he was first running. So basically 12 years ago today, and it's just incredible. I told him, I said, Alan, nobody could have foreseen what a transformational uh, mayor you would be. But I think now we've we've uncorked the genie of growth and we've got a lot of the problems associated with it, too. Yep. So. I think that's where I come in, you know, with a combination of executive background and uh, government experience uh, that I think can wrestle some of the bigger issues to the ground. Yeah. And, and we'll touch on some of that stuff too. So I guess that leads me to my first question, just so everyone's aware that's listening to this, Sue DeChambeau, who you're running against, will also be on the podcast. And I'm going to ask you guys the same questions, just see where the conversations kind of go from there. So this question I, I like particularly, it's what do you love about Biddeford? You know, I participated in a discussion on the uh, Biddeford community group the other day with a hundred good things about uh, Biddeford and geez, the list is long. I just came in before recording this from a, a mountain bike ride in Clifford Park. Yep. You can start there. 
go on. It isn't hard to come up with a hundred things from the food to the people, to the ice arena, uh, to the schools, to the connections in the industrial park and the business community. But I think just thematically, and I pop that on my website, a hundred good things about Biddeford, the community is really, is really the magic. And mm -hmm. that's what I want to continue and bring as mayor. I think we've done an incredible job with revitalizing downtown, but I'd like to see more of a community-wide focus too, and not have it just be about, you know, a couple of streets. Yeah, there has definitely been a focus on downtown, which is great because it needed it. And it's going to hopefully drive a lot of the other good things that happen in the city. But it is nice to spread that focus out of just downtown, you know, because just so much of the focus has been on that over the past few years. So yes, I agree. Yep. I like that idea of 100 good things about Biddeford. You know, when you try to put it that way and try to come up with a, all the good things, there are some great things. One of the things that honestly I think about that people don't even realize from out of town is how good the beaches are in Biddeford. Yes. Uh, I still quiet, like, Randy. Don't, don't say no. yeah, I know, right? I joke about that. I'll, I'll yes. cut this part out. It's like, don't tell people. But <laughs> it's honestly like I feel very fortunate to have had access to those beaches and still have access to those beaches my whole life and have my kids be able to play on them. And I mean, they're, they're just amazing, you know? So yeah, you go from Bath House to Middles to Forcey Rocks, all that. Yeah. You'll see a bunch of decking that I donated, by the way, around there, <laughs> especially at Bath House. But yeah, those beaches are incredible. And I am a real amateur surfer, but that's, that's another thing. I mean, yeah. the people just raving about the surfing these days. And that's a great community thing too. I 100% agree. I'm yep. adding that to the list. <laughs> Add it to the list. So that's that's the first thing that I think of. So next thing is, what do you think some of the biggest challenges are that Bitterford is facing right now? And there's probably a handful of them. Probably who knows where the conversation leads from here. Yeah, thematically, I mean, I, I mentioned, you know, we, we've got growth now. And look, I mean, think about what's happening in the, in the world. Of course, we have growth. We, we, this is a great place to live. Look at the, the weather, the climate disasters that are going on throughout the world. Here we sit, you know, we've got water, we've got resources, we've got sun, we've got a, a good place to live that's stable and secure. I was just talking to a police officer from a town in Louisiana that's around the same size as Biddeford, and he was telling me about the crime rate down there. Yeah. It's just it's just jarring to think mm -hmm. about. I mean, so we are going to face growth, and that's a good thing, but I think we've we've really got to manage it, and I think within the city... Now we're in this place where we need to be more strategic about it. We need to be more thoughtful and we need to use growth to reduce costs for our long-term residents too. And that's something that I'm just super focused on. I think there's all kinds of opportunities within the city to find efficiency that will reduce costs. You know, maybe we have the same position in two different departments. Why do we have to do it that way? Maybe we got a communication problem. I've seen hundreds of these things as a counselor now. You've got, you know, the water company emails over the the sewer the sewer company, and there's we pay somebody to sit and type those amounts in by hand so we can send out the bills. That is nuts. And that kind of stuff. I mean, I'm a business guy. I've solved problems like that before. Yeah. I think growth is good, but we we've got to find some of that structure that will help reduce costs. We just can't keep pushing costs off to the residents. We can't make every every decision one. Okay, grow, grow, grow. At, at all costs. I, I don't see that making sense. So I'm going to come in. I'm going to clarify some of those policies and procedures running this thing. You can't say run government like a business, but you can find those types of efficiencies that are going to reduce the cost for a long-term resident. So I'm super, super focused on that. One of the issues that people complain, not complain about, but like I talk about a lot lately is the homelessness that you see around town. Yep. And I think that that's not something that's unique to Biddeford. It seems like it's probably happening a lot of places in, in the country as the cost of housing rises and, you know, people find themselves in these tough situations. Is that something that you think that the city can address or is it a bigger problem than a, a Biddeford thing? I mean, I would say both, right? So we, I think we've got to look uh, super hard and pushing this on the council on our, uh, our general assistance reimbursements rates, you know, which is a state funded thing. I think we just need to clarify that so we can get some people that are on the cost on the cusp uh, into housing. And mm -hmm. I, I think with any problem like this, Randy, you, you've got to get understand the size of it and the scope of it. So we're doing that now with, with a survey that's gonna be published in the next couple of weeks. And then it's an individual problem. Like back when I was selling composite decking, I used to say, we wanna sell a hundred trucks of composite decking. You, you can't sell a hundred trucks of composite mm -hmm. decking. Now you can sell 
enough decks to enough people that it'll make a hundred truckloads. But yep. you got to do these types of problems in that kind of way where we've got to work with each of the individuals from a case management point of view to help them land where it's going to be right for them. I think broadly speaking, what you see is maybe a third of them are substance use disorder or some kind of mental health and, you know, need to be handled in accordance with their needs and so on. So we, we can work with these individuals to make that situation better and just increase the pace of which we're making housing available, I think, at all levels too, mm -hmm. just to break that loose. The council has made some initial moves. We just passed the back lots provision. We think that's going to open up about 75 or 100 new homes. But yeah, what is we that? clearly just so, need just so I understand what that is. What's the back so, lots provision? Sometimes they call it flag lots. And this has been an education for me too, but I, mm -hmm. I think it's good policy moving forward. And I, I applaud Councillor Lessard for really pushing that. So yeah, flag lot, you know, you, you have a hundred feet of road frontage and then it, you have acres behind you that are landlocked because of that road frontage requirement. Now you mm -hmm. can do another lot right behind you. Yep. And I mean, there's excavators inside of my house running uh, at, a, at a neighbor's to put in another another home, like a starter home there. So I, th I think that's going to break loose some things. And we just got to do a lot more of that. We actually have, a lot of people don't know this, we have 1,300 or so apartments or condos or houses currently permitted, and about half of which are actually under construction in Bitterford yep. as we speak. So we're coming out of this, but we've got to be smart about it and do more things to make it easier for developers at all levels. You know, we've scared off some starter home developments recently. Have we? Yeah. Yes. We hate to hear that. Just unbelievable. So yeah, we, we chased off a 240 home starter home development, you know, with some tangles in the planning board and rec commission and stuff like that. So we, we just can't do that. We can't afford to do that anymore. Yeah. I mean, not just for Bitterford, just for Southern Maine in general, we need as many housing projects being worked on as possible. I see in my business, in the mortgage industry, real estate industry, housing shortage is as big of a problem as I've ever seen since I've been in the business. So yeah, the, the the more schools, places affects better. businesses. Yeah. Yeah. yeah we got to clarify all that. I see tons of communication issues around city hall that I think I can just straighten out. You know, I'm mm -hmm. not, I'm not fancy, you know, I have basic <laughs> ways that I do it. Hey, maybe we do, you know, a stand up meeting every Monday morning with a couple of key departments, that kind of thing. Let's yep. just get everybody talking. I have that, you know, as a CEO, that's the way I do it. I do a 30 minute meeting once a week with each of my key people, 10 minutes for you, 10 minutes for me, 10 minutes for the future. That's my structure. Yep. We do it. We do it every week. You know what's coming. You know this stuff that you can hold for each other until next week and make sure that things are moving. We just mm -hmm. got to do some basic stuff like that that I think will cut the turnover in City Hall, too. And it will give us just a much better structure where we find that efficiency so we don't just shunt that inefficiency off to the residents. That's something I see out of the gate. How about the parking garage? I know we emailed a little bit about this, but do people yeah. talk to you a lot about that? Or I mean, or is it more of a social media topic than an actual topic that people discuss with you? You know, one of the very first things as I, I was exposed to as a counselor was a resident who lives down the street from me who is just a wonderful guy. The guy is, he's a welder <laughs> at, at the shipyard. I mean, absolutely wonderful guy. Uh, mm -hmm. Likes all people at Biddeford, you know, and, and doesn't have a smartphone, doesn't want to have a smartphone, never had a smartphone, no reason for it. So, I mean, that, that structure around that garage is just, it's just broken. There's no two ways about it. So, you know, the incentives are wrong. You know, and I'm not here really to cast blame on anybody. I get why it was done and why it made sense at the time. And, you know, who saw COVID coming and, you know, development has been delayed. There's, there's a plenty of reasons to go around, but I just want to fix it. So, yeah. and I, you know, we, a few weeks ago at a council meeting, we were ready to write $200,000 check to the, to the manager. I said, no, <laughs> write these people yeah, a check. Because, yeah. Is that money owed or for something else? It's a quote unquote stabilization payment, right? So that's basically the deal work, way the deal works. So if there's not enough people using the garage, then, you know, what incentive do they have to make it easier to the garage if, if they get paid anyway? I mean, who, who, who would do things in, in that way, right? I mean, I don't need a hustle. I get the check no matter what. So I just, I think there's a, a meeting to be had and a revision of that structure to be completed with that parking garage manager. I mean, it's literally the first thing I will work on as yeah. mayor because it's costing us as taxpayers this 
unbelievable money to buy empty parking spaces in an empty garage. Yeah. Do not want to do it. Do not want anything to do with it. I think we can fix it. I think what I learned is that manager, developer, premium parking, they don't like running those outer lots in Biddeford, you know, in Water Street, Foss Street, uh, yeah. Washington Street. They don't actually want anything to do with those because it's hard to enforce. Let's take those back as the city of Biddeford. Um, we will make money on those. Those are great resources for the city. We can use them for events. We can control them again. We can have our residents have a good feeling about parking in there instead of, you know, these horrible experience that they keep having where they get a $65 ticket because, you know, they're, they tried to do the right thing and there's no way out of it. And, you know, the customer service guy, some guy named Rocky, and he's very threatening. Yeah, we're going to fix that when I'm mayor and we're going to sort it out and we're going to make a longer term deal that's better for Biddeford. It's it's pretty much the number one thing that I hear about. So, yeah, I'm pretty focused on it. I don't want to point fingers about the deal that was made before I understand it, but I just think we can come out the other side of it. I appreciate the focus on the solution approach rather than focus on the problem. And there's so yeah. much complaining on social media and social media is just yeah. perfectly set up for complaining and complaining and complaining. But like, I think the focus on, okay, what do we do now to fix it is a good one. So it's, it's nice, nice yeah, to hear and I get it. I, I get it. Why people are upset, upset and, but I just get it. We'll come out the other side of it. And you know what, when there's buildings are built on either side of it, there's going to be a grocery store on one side. They're right across from where Mull for Mulligan's. There's going to be a bunch of residences. There's going to be a lighted pathway running to Riverwalk. You know, that thing will be full and we'll flip it. So Biddeford makes money. We just yeah. got to get to that place. And that I think you just, that kind of executive leadership experience, that's what I want to bring to it and make those things, hold the people accountable that are behind it, make sure those things happen. Yeah, cool. Love to hear it. So kind of a joke one, but one of the biggest things that I'm seeing online now is the old islands on May Street. You must see social media posts about that <laughs> stuff all out. <laughs> yes, yes, yep. I mean, there's uh, nothing you can do. Like, I don't even really have an opinion on one way or the other, but I do enjoy seeing the banter on social media. Just a, another thing for people to complain. I, about. Look, I, I get it. So the Mayfield is, some, you know, ball games there. A great Biddeford heritage. Um, remember bringing my kids there when in 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 these massive snowstorms and letting them go down the slides and the snow and everything. But that's just it. I mean, we put the police department put out the speed recorders out there. We had people. We had several people going seventy. We had somebody going eighty. So, I mean, we have to do something. So you can quibble with the way that we did it, but I think we did a good thing. So the traffic islands definitely slow people down. And I think people should know that we did it ourselves. Our public works department is <laughs> incredible. I mean, whether our mayor or not, let's, let's think about them. They're, they done amazing work. So they did all of that really, really economically. And the point is, yeah, maybe that first one, I tend to agree, actually, it's a little too big. <laughs> hey, we did it ourselves. We can fix it. So we closed that first one up a little bit. And But that's part of our heritage in Biddeford. Uh, we need to invest a lot more than just the islands. We need sidewalks. We need improvements over there. But we yeah. can't lose that feeling over there on May Street of, you know, that's the place where you bring your kids. That's where you feel safe. That's, you know, that's generations of 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 our kids going through that place. And we just can't have people going 80 miles an hour through there. It's just, it's not okay. I basically live at one of those fields in the summertime. So yeah. we spend a lot of time there, a ton of traffic, ton of people Magic. flying by. Yes. Yeah. I, I actually take that road multiple times a day because I live not too far from the high school. So when I'm coming from the highway, it's always cutting across May Street and it's an easy road to go fast on. And I guess I don't really have an opinion one way or the other. I'm not an expert on on the best way to slow cars down. So I'm going to take someone's word for it when they decided to do those. And I, I think they have a potential to actually look kind of nice, but I know yep. there's a lot of, a lot of talk on it, on social media about it. The so data is, you know, that's the best thing for pedestrians. It's a little safe spot for them, especially mm -hmm. kids, older people, they get halfway across the street, that it literally is an Island. Mm -hmm. And so that they can kind of recalibrate and get the rest of the way if the traffic is that bad. But yeah, I think we keep tweaking on it. You know, we need to spend, we got to do a lot of these things wisely. We got to be sensible how we think about it. We probably need to spend half a million bucks in improvements over there to really get that right with the sidewalk so that we can have the kids away from the traffic so we can mm -hmm. still have parking. And, you know, longer term, 
is there another exit? Do you go from South Street to 111? Those discussions are the, the community wants to have. And, you know, I think the mayor needs to get that input and figure out if that's something that we would want. That would take a ton of pressure off of May Street if we did totally. that. Well, that's why I take it all the time to get to the mm -hmm. highway. I am one of those people that is so for that. I can't even tell you, but I know everyone has an opinion <laughs> on it. It would make my life so much easier getting getting to and from the highway. But I know there's yep. a lot of considerations on something like that and making that sort of decision. So yes, it's nice including, to that they're having it. Yeah, bike friendliness is a big priority of mine. You'll see that on my website, martymayor.com. Yep. Yeah. Okay, last question. Why should anyone vote for you for mayor? What's the main main reason? Look, Alan Casavan has been mayor for 12 years. He's been absolutely incredible. He's been mm -hmm. transformational. I just saw an article in the paper that said, you know, is Sanford the next Spitterford? Would anybody have written something like that when he was elected in 2011? I don't think so. So think about that magic, but look ahead at all of the growth that we've got. And we are going to have pressure because people want to move here. And that's a good thing. I mean, you got forces of, of climate forces, you've got great schools and all those types of things that make Biddeford a desirable place. We mm -hmm. need somebody with that executive background who can handle that growth, do it smartly and wisely, and also take on the problems that come with it. You know, I have a neighbor constituent who just moved here from Denver. And he said, you know, it reminds me of Denver 30, 40 years ago. And let's hold on to that magic because now Denver, you can't get anywhere with waiting, you know, two and a half hours in, in traffic and so forth. So I think I'm the right leader to bring us into that next phase where we have focus a little bit more on growing more wisely, take on the big problems, sorting out the garage, approaching homelessness smartly, housing affordability, and just managing all of those things within City Hall to be efficient so that we don't push the costs out onto the residents and we can maintain the desirability uh, for all of the people of Biddeford. So I am focused on those things. I have a background in business and also in renewable energy. I want to push us ahead to do things that cut costs and also address climate change at the same time. For example, we have a solar array going on the high school, as you know. We yep. can do a ton more of that kind of thing. We buy hundreds of thousands of gallons of oil per year. Why are we doing that? Uh, renewable energy is half the cost of grid energy right now. So let's invest in those things at the same time. At the same time, while we do stuff like improve the Bitterford Ice Arena and all of the things that make this town great. So it's a lot to juggle, but I think I'm the guy to do it uh, with that business and nonprofit and government background. I bring all of that to the table. So I'm excited to take on the challenge. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for coming on the podcast. Always great to talk to you. Where's the best way to find you online? Maybe your website or social media? Yeah, martymayor.com or uh, Facebook, Marty Groman's Community Corner. See me down at Westbrook Skating Rink or anywhere like that. I'm always looking forward to hearing from people. Awesome. Well, thanks again. Best of luck with the election. We'll be in touch. All right. Talk to you soon, Randy. Thanks a ton.